Welcome to the Initiative One Leadership Podcast, where we help leaders maximize their impact and transform their lives. I'm your host, Romeo Marquez Jr., as well as the Chief Growth Officer for Initiative One. I'm super excited for this episode because one, it is our very first episode, and two, today's guest is Initiative One's founder and CEO, Dr. Fred Johnson. He's going to share with us his journey on how he started the Initiative One Leadership Institute, along with tips that will help you elevate your leadership. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Fred Johnson. Dr. Fred, thank you so much for joining us today as our very first guest on our podcast. Thank you, Romeo. I'm looking forward to it. So how can I be helpful to you and our audience today? Well, I have a few questions that I know that is going to be of great service to me and especially our audience. So the first question that I have is, what inspired you to create Initiative One? You know, Romeo, when I was young, way back in my teenage years, I just had, even back then, I had this passion to learn everything I could about leaders. I can't describe it any other way, but I've always been just unbelievably passionate and hungry and inquisitive about the subject of leadership and how uh, its simplicity, its complexity all rolled into one. It's always evolving, but yet, It's timeless at the same time, and I've always felt a calling toward it. And so, you know, sometimes life makes choices for us that we would have never had the courage to make on our own. And I remember um, way back in the 90s, over 25 years ago, my life fell apart because of choices that I had made due to addictive behaviors that finally came to terms with me before I came to terms with it. And it opened up a window while I was recovering and healing and and getting a deeper aspect, a sense of, of who I was. And it opened up an opportunity to make some major transitions from my previous life in ministry. And even though I had the opportunity to go back into that area, I chose not to because I felt that my own brokenness and my own healing and growth really provided a diving platform to dive into a new area that I felt already that I had been called to. So I made a decision to start my own leadership company in the basement of my home in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I was scared to death. You know, starting your own company and all the risks and also needing to be uh, marginally uh, successful financially just to make sure you pay your bills and feed your family. It was a terrifying but yet exhilarating time in my life. And uh, within one month, back in 1999, I knew I made the right decision. That's how I got into it. I started off as a one person show. It was that way for about a year and a half, but that's what led me to get involved. And then word of mouth just started taking off. I would have never in a million years have told you 25 years later that I would have had, and the team that we had developed would have had the kind of opportunities that we've seen over the last several years. So it's just been an awesome, awesome experience. What obstacles did you face along the way? And how did you overcome those obstacles when building up Initiative One? The biggest obstacle that I faced was myself. It was the fear of the terrifying fear of failure that actually at times caused me to to really fall back into workaholism while I was talking about how to find wholeness in our lives. And it was really about believing in myself and investing in myself. 
and overcoming all for every time that you declare where you want to go into your life, there's going to be 10 people who come out of the word work and transfer their own experience onto you. And they tell you that you're not going to succeed. And what are you doing this for? And there's too many people involved in leadership and no one believes in leadership. And I'll never forget the first day that we opened up our new headquarters in, in Wisconsin. We had a, a city councilman who came in, walked in the first day in our beautiful building and with great enthusiasm and encouragement said to me, we don't need leadership development in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and you all will never succeed. That was the opening line from the city of, of leadership talking about we don't need leadership. And I, I remember those kinds of situations along the line, but I kept reminding myself that, you know what, nothing's going to keep me from this. There was a tenacity, there was a resiliency, and there were days that all I had was a sense of purpose. I had no proof. I had no guarantee, but I knew what I knew what I knew. And there were days that all I had to go on was this compelling sense of purpose. And there were days that that's all I needed. And I would say to anybody who's about to embark on a life altering journey in order to get in, in alignment with your purpose, it's scary. But as long as you are attached to a compelling purpose and you never let go, you're going to fumble your way forward. And um, that's what my experience has been. Amazing. And that's what makes not only you great, it makes the company great and it makes the companies you work with even better. So thank you for, you know, staying on purpose. Uh, and speaking of just initiative one, many people have worked with initiative one, but there's a lot of people that uh, haven't worked with initiative one yet. So what can you tell people about what initiative one does and how they can help their company organization? You know, sometimes other people can describe what we do better than what we do, how we describe it. I, I had a bank president who described it just yesterday to me, and I went, wow, that's great. Here's what he said. You guys are in the business of releasing the power of human cooperation. Wow. When, when you are a team that begins to trust each other and cooperate with each other and challenge each other and push each other and collaborate and you become one, it is amazing what that team can accomplish as opposed to a group of people who are self-serving, who are being dominated by their own personal agendas by being a team that's pulling apart, uh, pulling each other in different directions at the same time. And people ask me all the time, what, is there any really return on investment? And here's, I just started laughing after this bank president was talking to me. He said, anybody who would suggest that there is not a deep return on investment after a team becomes one headed in the same direction able to make deep decisions, courageous decisions, faster than ever, and their ability to rise above the noise and stay focused on their purpose. Anybody who could see the return on investment that comes from that is absolutely blind and deaf. That's what he said to me yesterday. And so that's what we do. We really help teams unleash what their potential is by becoming a real powerhouse team. I love that. And to your point, like, it, yes, we can talk about the mission. We could talk about the vision, but when people share their experience and what, how they see it, it's nothing but transformative. It's nothing but breakthroughs. It's nothing but life changing and game changing for them. So allowing our customers and clients share who we really are rather than saying, oh yeah, this is who we are. This is what we do. No, it's the results, not for us, but results for them. So thank you for bringing that up. You're welcome. All right. What would you say with all the different companies and organizations you've worked with and all the various leaders you worked with, 
what would you say are some common qualities they have uh, that makes them great? That's pretty easy. Over 20 something years of doing this and well over 400 companies and organizations, we have found no matter what their field is, and we've worked with 21 different fields of industry from healthcare to professional sports, to collegiate sports, to academia, to banking, to attorneys, to retail. I mean, you name it, we've done it. Here's what we have found are always present in the companies that we, in the organizations that have really profound results. They are led by teams that are humble. They're not afraid to acknowledge mistakes. I was coaching a young man today and he was talking and he was very gifted and profoundly successful in his field. And yet he was examining a decision that he had made recently. And he said, you know what? Quite frankly, I blew it. And I lost a customer because I didn't fulfill a commitment that I had made. And it was completely on me. And I learned from that. And I want to get better. I mean, great leaders, they're not afraid at all to point the finger at themselves and and take responsibility for where they need to grow. And also really effective leaders, they're not defensive. What we've learned is if your default, whenever you're being given feedback is to go to defensiveness, you're done as a leader because you are shutting down the very information that is required for you to break through to the next place in your life. And so effective leaders, they're not defensive. They point the finger at themselves and they're willing to be honest in their evaluations of of themselves. And there's also, even though they're humble, there is a, there is an unquenchable belief in themselves. You know, humility is not self-abasement. Humility is an acknowledgement of where your gifts come from, and it's an acknowledgement that they are indeed gifts and that they can be taken from us at any time. And so humility is not the absence of self-belief. Along that line, what we have found is effective leaders, they're constantly and consistently working on their own self-narratives. That, that, you know what, I am enough, that I am of infinite value, that my mistakes don't define me. I am not a mistake if I am a mistake, and that a mistake is an, is an opportunity um, for accelerated learning. It is a tuition payment into my success. So effective leaders are constantly working on confronting their negative narratives and and notice what I said, we, it, it's not the absence of negative narratives. We all have negative narratives, but there is a relentlessness to continue to confront those narratives and say, where's the proof for that? I don't see the proof for that. So we see that those traits in leaders, that they're humble, they're willing to confront their, their narratives, but also they recognize that they're only as good as the people around them, the leaders that we work with who have the highest level of effectiveness, they hire the best people around them. And to the point that they celebrate when they can land someone on their team that's more gifted, more capable and smarter than they are. And and they're not threatened by that. They celebrate that. Um, And so those are some of the characteristics I'd say one last uh, characteristic is that they are consumed and obsessed with purpose, something bigger than they are, greater than they are, something that is so huge that there is no way that they can accomplish it by themselves. You know, I tell people all the time, if your purpose is something that you can do all by yourself, it's not much of a purpose. Those are some of the characteristics that I would say. Speaking of purpose. What can one do to find that purpose or, and, or live that purpose out more fully? First of all, you got to know what it is. We know that less than 1% of people know absolutely without a doubt what their purpose is. 
and they make hard decisions, courageous decisions every day to order their lives and their decisions around their purpose. And we talk about the five questions that people need to know. And we ask people to go on a journey with themselves in answering these questions. Number one is, what rings the joy bell of your heart? Any time that you're miserable, you're not on purpose. Purpose, even in the midst of the hardships, there's always an element of joy and contentment in the midst of the pain. And so one, I, I tell people, you know, your purpose is always found somewhere in the bucket of joy. The second thing that I would say is, is it in alignment with your natural gifts, talents, and abilities? You know, to be given a purpose that you're not being naturally gifted for is a cosmic, cruel game. If God gives us a purpose, he's certainly going to give us the ability to fulfill that purpose. Now, those abilities may need to be honed. They may need to be polished. They may, may need to be discovered, but they're there. So what rings my joy bell? What's within my natural gifts, talents, and abilities? When am I having my highest impact upon other people for good? Our purpose is always our sweet spot where we have our highest capacity for good in the lives of other people. And so the irony is it's often we're so close to our purpose that other people who know us well clearly can see what our purpose is sometimes before we do. And that is why I say to people, go up to five or six people who know you well and say, you know, when I'm at my best, you know, when I'm having my greatest impact, what am I doing? What am I, what am I engaged in? And they'll say, oh, well, Fred or Bill or Cindy, that's when you're doing this. And that's when you're engaged in this. And oh, by the way, it's those things that create joy in your life. They're those things that are in alignment with your talents and your gifts. I think the other thing is, does it create rain in the lives of other people? You know, if your purpose is not nourishing the lives of other people and creating and helping them to have opportunities that would not have been present if you hadn't come into the, their lives, if your purpose is not creating nourishment in the other uh, in the lives of others and it's only for you, that's not purpose, that's narcissism. And so ultimately purpose is that it enriches the lives of other people and because of you being on purpose with yourself in their lives, it, it introduces the realm of possibilities that would never happen if you hadn't come into their lives. And that's what's so cool about purpose. You know, purpose doesn't just bring you joy. It brings other people joy. And then I think the last is, can you do this without losing intimacy with the key people in your life? Purpose never sucks the life out of other people so that you can have your joy. Purpose never breaks down relationships. That's not purpose. If it does, if someone is talking about being on purpose, but being on purpose causes them to lose touch with the key people in their lives, that's not purpose. That's addiction using purpose language. And so those are the five questions that we're constantly asking people to do a long soak on and to get in touch with themselves. And I can tell you this, there is a direct correlation between knowing your purpose and having a magnificent impact beyond your days. And that's what we have found. Great leaders are purpose led and the purpose obsessed people right now if you can't see me i'm doing like a standing ovation because that was fred being on purpose talking about purpose and i feel even more empowered to continue to live out my purpose so thank you for sharing that that was powerful if you didn't receive that and you were distracted, you better rewind back because Dr. Fred broke it down. All right. So one last question before I get into the rapid fire question and answer. What's your advice for leaders that want to take things to the next level? Are you willing to overcome your fear that is saying to you, don't do it? 
Are you willing to have the courage to fail forward? Are you willing to believe enough in yourself to invest in yourself and to make the necessary changes to help you leave from your current reality that is not being fulfilling to obtain the reality that you want with all of your heart. It requires courage. It requires tenacity, but it requires a commitment. That's right. That is right. All right. Let's get into the uh, rapid fire Q and a answer with the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Dr. Fred? Yes. First question. What is a book you would recommend? You know what? He's written a lot of books, but one of my all-time favorite books is The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. I mean, it, it, it's not rocket science, but it really teaches you about leadership and how to love and lead people. What is your favorite movie or documentary that you would recommend? Well, my favorite movie is not a documentary. It's a movie called Hoosiers, which I was obsessed with growing up in Indiana. I've watched it 39 times. Didn't change my life, but it's still my favorite movie. I <laughs> um, love it. You know, uh, my favorite movie of all times as it relates to uh, leadership is a movie called Freedom Riders, W-R-I-T-E-R-S. And it's a movie about a high school teacher who took on a bunch of inner city kids that, that had, had not been given much opportunity and how she changed her life and their lives. And while everybody else was discouraging her, it is a great movie about the reality of change and what you have to go through to get there. Freedom Riders, W-R-I-T-E-R-S. It is a great movie. Love that movie. One of your favorite quotes. Uh, you either live your life by your purpose or you will live your life by someone else's noise and there is no in between. One or two skill sets a leader must have in order to be great. To encourage others and to forgive others. Uh, one of the best investments you've made that has helped you in your life's journey. I'd say the best investment that I ever made that helped me in my life's journey was to invest the $23,000 that it took to put myself through training to learn how to build a leadership company. Amazing. It's if, paid itself off many, many, many times over. If you could have dinner with three people dead or alive, who would they be? First person would be Abraham Lincoln. I'd want to know how in the world that he was able to maintain his focus against unrelenting criticism and heartache. I'd say a second one would be, you know, uh, I would love to, to uh, have dinner with John Wooden on how he was able to motivate diverse people year after year after year for an uncommon dream. And I think, um, you know, another one would be Harry Truman, someone who had to make unbelievable decisions that no matter what decision that he made, it had a back end. If he didn't make a decision, if he had a back, it had a back end. If he did make a decision, it had a back end. And how does a leader make wrenching decisions when there's no guarantee? He really taught me about leadership during times of being in a crucible. What do you value? Love and people. I what? love people. What do you know for sure? That there's a God who loves me and um, I'll spend eternity with him. What do you want people to remember about you? That I was a person who was a giver. And any last words you want to give to our audience? Grab a dream bigger than yourself. Don't be afraid to go after it no matter what. And don't give up. Thank you for sharing that. And there you have it, y'all. Dr. Fred Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Fred. It's always an honor and a gift to just connect with you whenever we get the chance to. So thank you for the value you consistently share with not only me, but for everybody else around you. Thank you, Romeo. We appreciate you, buddy. 
Thank you for tuning in to the Initiative One Leadership Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with a friend, family member, or colleague, or leave a rating and review. Also, be sure to subscribe to our podcast so that you can stay up to date for new episodes. And don't forget to sign up for our leadership newsletter for new content along with invites to our live and virtual events. You can go to initiative1.com. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you on the next episode.